Okay, so this is Corporate Accountability Forums, and uh, where we ask uh, difficult questions and think about some of the big issues and occasionally come up with uh, some solutions and think about those as well. Today, uh, our guest speaker is former Chief Judge of the Delaware Supreme Court, Leo Strine Jr. And uh, he's here to talk to us. If, if you took a look at the list of publications that I put up on my website about you know what Leo has done over the or written over the last several years, I mean this is you know most academics that are up for tenure haven't published anywhere, anywhere near as much with anywhere near as much regularity. And also he delves into questions, I think, that are key to uh, corporate accountability, the key to the questions and the topics that we've been raising. So, uh, Leo, do you want to start with a few remarks? And no, thank you, Jim. It's, it's, it's good to be with you and with folks who care so much about the integrity of our corporate governance system. I, I, as I understand it, we're gonna be conversational, so I'm not gonna do a sort of sad lecture, but I do wanna give a little bit of context. I, said, I think it is not coincidental that the share of the gains from our capital system that go to the constituency that's most important for its success, um, that's the workers, has gone down since 1980. Um, I think it's it, most economists should understand this and most people who deal with national defense or most people who play sports will understand it. If the power of one group, in this case, that of stockholders and especially the new form of stockholders, institutional investors goes way up and the power of another constituency goes way down, which is labor, then one would expect that the system would produce results more favorable to the first group than the second group. And that's exactly what happened. And the reality is that it's a self-defeating approach to wealth creation because in many ways, the most important way that corporations create wealth for society is by paying workers good salaries and providing them with economic security. And for all but the top 1% of Americans, most of their wealth is attributable to their job. And that includes what they get to invest. Their continued access to a job is what funds their 401k. And for most American workers, and this is increasingly true throughout the market economies, you have to set aside money for your own retirement by giving it over to the same institutional investors who put pressure on companies. We've also had the coincidence of the belief in the Friedman view of the world, which is that companies exist basically to provide money for their investors and the argument that companies should just stick to that and that you leave external protections um, to do the work of protecting other stakeholders like workers, consumers, the environment, and communities. One of the things often left out of the debate here though is that the people who sold this idea, what do they think about external, external protections for stakeholders? Often lost in, in when everybody says, well, that's not a bad idea. Milton Friedman didn't mean anybody any harm. Well, he opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 he opposed the minimum wage laws. He opposed the National Labor Relations Act. He opposed the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. <laughs> I didn't know so, that. So, and if you remember, the, the Justice Powell, before he became a justice, wrote a letter to the American business community basically saying this New Deal, great society, is sort of ruining our country. Now, Weirdly, he wrote this at a time when American hegemony was never stronger, when American equality was never greater, and when we were closing the racial uh, wealth gap. 
but the reality is it took hold. And then, of course, when you had the so-called Reagan revolution, which in many ways was a revolution against the idea of the modern economy and being regulated in the public interest. And so, and then we had the changes in the capital markets, Jim, as you know, which is the nature of stockholders themselves changed, which is they went from being largely wealthy individuals who invested because they liked the company or stable pension funds, same thing, to becoming institutions, um, increasingly managing ordinary people's money because of 401k. The Reagan, I Friedman view that the market was always right took hold. And these institutions have been giving, given ever more power. They seek gain for themselves. And by the way, they are not necessarily paid in the way that the ultimate owners are, because they're the ones, these institutions are the ones who invest directly in companies and vote their stock. But the ordinary Americans who are invested through 401k don't vote the stock directly. They don't actually get, take out their money until they're 60. And ma many of these folks increasingly invest in index funds. I've been talking about this for the whole century, Jim, the whole idea of the, I think I wasn't smart enough to call it a universal owner, mm. but the idea that you should hold the, basically a proxy mm. for the whole economy, that you're not going to trade in and out of stocks. You want a system that focuses on fundamental growth, net of externalities, because that's what you need when you're invested in a broad swath of the economy, because if externality costs are shifted to you as a taxpayer, you pay them. If they are shifted to other companies, you own that other company too. And if, and you're also likely, if you're a worker or a consumer to suffer any of those externalities, you're not immune. The harm that's been done by the opioid crisis, for example, to communities or to the Gulf of Mexico, it's not like if you, that you're just invested in those companies and so that you just rode those up. No, you suffer in all the different ways. But we've had a, a system that was increasingly less protective of other stakeholders with a much more vibrant stock market power over the companies that make real products and deliver real services. This is coupled with a globalizing economy where frankly, just competitive product and service pressures from competitive nations have grown. And even in the other OECD nations where the, the decline in worker and externality protection has not been as profound as the US, globalizing the trade regime without globalizing environmental protection or labor standards has in fact empowered the financial class and the moneyed capital. And again, that puts distributional uh, pressure on workers in particular. And I'll give you evidence, much of the evidence about um, activism shows that to the extent there's any gains from activism, that they're actually largely transfer payments, where the increased risk and leverage of companies, you know, it, it might pump up the stock price short term, but to the detriment of company uh, creditors and to the detriment of company workers. And for ordinary investors and Americans, one, as an investor, most of us are told to put a substantial amount of our portfolio in debt, not just equity. And particularly when you save for college, right? If any of you have a four of whatever the, 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 the 427 or 429 or whatever it is, 529. 529. Yeah. I'm sensing enough to eventually hit on a number. I was just gonna, <laughs> for everybody listening, I was eventually, I was just going to name every number until I hit it. <laughs> right. But if you've saved for your kid for college, you realize that at the beginning of the arc of your savings, when you're further away, it's more equity. As mm -hmm. the, your kid gets into high school, a substantial amount of your portfolio is debt. When you reach retirement years and you need some of that stuff for liquidity and you need to have a little bit of safer balance, the same sort of thing happens. So transfers from a value to equity away from debt, that doesn't grow your overall portfolio. And again, most of us derive more of our wealth from a job. And so if the overall arc is that we make money at the expense of workers, and that's not sort of good, but that's where we are. And, and, and there's a good paper by Larry Summers and, um, and Professor Stansberry at Harvard that show, you know, that link directly this change in power dynamic to the growth in American inequality. 
and <laughs> excuse me, and they isolate for globalization. And they show this is a, a much more greater effect in the US. This echoes good work by Larry Michelle at, at the EPI. And to relate it to another issue that's very central to our identity in which we have not come close to addressing fully, racial inequality. Black people did not get labor rights in this country really to the late 1960s. Up through to the end of the 1970s, the combination of the New Deal, which the New Deal did not include black people in its blessings to the extent that it should, but it was still beneficial to black people. It wasn't as beneficial as it was to others, but it was highly beneficial. Things like the minimum wage, it did help. And the Great Society, of course, completed that in a way that was racially equal and did things like healthcare and other sorts of things. The racial um, uh, inequality gap was narrowing until the, until the presidency of Ronald Reagan. I'm not gonna blame President Reagan for all this, but if you put together the approach of Reagan and Friedman and the power of these institutions, and then you think about what happened which is just take the share of capitalist gains that would have been going to workers in the 60s or 70s, and then you reduce it. If people are climbing the economic ladder, they are much more likely to be wage earners, right? And to need that. And who is most likely to be at the bottom, you know, at the suffering that stagnation and not at the top? It's going to be the emerging workers. That's people are much more likely to be black. And so it's not coincidental to this reduction in the worker's share that inequality has widened, which is a shame. I mean, inequality has actually widened in this nation in the last 40 years. And it's also not coincidental that the ability to make nativist appeals has increased because struggling white workers in parts of the country that have not thrived, uh, when people feel in insecurity, they often look for an answer. That's when you get these arguments from, for natives to appeals blaming other people. And so one of the best things we can actually do to knit our nation back together is to make sure that our capitalist system provides more fair wages and economic security. That is a race neutral approach that will actually disproportionately benefit black people because of where they are on this spectrum. But it will also address the struggling white workers who you know, I think polls will show have been subject to some of these nativist appeals. So I've talked a lot about the problem, but what are some answers that we could do? I, if you'd asked me and um, Jim in at the beginning of the century, I would have largely say be skeptical of internal corporate governance answers that you really have to. And I still believe fundamentally the protections have to be uh, boundaries on competition um, that are set externally by society. Mm -hmm. But I've made a fundamental uh, shift that I don't, I don't think that relying on external protections is, is adequate anymore. And, and there's, a very one, there's one very simple reason for it. When the United States Supreme Court rewrote the Constitution to give corporations the unlimited ability to pollute our politics, while, by the way, <laughs> Um, continuing to discriminate against unions by using totally different reasoning when they apply on um, the same, the, mm -hmm. when they, they look at unions in the political process, it's no longer an adequate answer. Because if you for, if people forget, Citizen John overturned McCain Feingold. Right. That McCain was a, is a, a war hero, was a war hero, a national hero who's Republican. The Affordable Care Act was passed by Congress and it was struck the during the pandemic, it would have been really great to have the Medicaid expansion in the states that needed it most. By the way, for our economy, that would have produced cost control because it gave to the government. Um, the government was going to re be responsible for that, allowing the private sector to cover the more affordable part. Well, that was that was passed through the process, struck down by an activist court. Um, all the stuff you read about Voting Rights Act around the country and voter thing. That wasn't happening, why? Because the Voting Rights Act had been extended 98 to two in the Senate. And I don't even think there was a dissent in the House. Struck down again by the US Supreme Court. So with businesses free to give 
unlimited sums of money to thing, what do they do? They engage in rent seeking. They, they give money for regulatory policies that help them. The reality is if labor was capital, then we wouldn't be having this conversation because the labor would have the money. Capital has the money and they have other people's money and they're using other people's money to lobby. And the sum total of everybody's rent seeking is not overall gains. It doesn't cancel each other out. It just means each segment of the economy gets tilted more towards the haves. The, environment, the evidence is overwhelming that labor is way outspent by business. Consumer grants are way outspent and so are environmental groups. And so I've come to the view, Jim, that you need a combination of some internal changes and external changes. And there's another thing I've mentioned. We are not in 1960 or 1970. The stockholders are profoundly different. It's not that corporate law has changed. Law was built on certain expectations. Stockholders used to own stock really for the long term. Companies had a geographic focus and it was a different. Now you have stockholders have really no connection to the company. We put independent directors in and they act, they were, they're designed to be weather instruments for the stock market and they have. And the institution are much more powerful. So that some of the assumptions behind corporate law that could allow it to be as enabling in a way and sort of leaning towards stockholders may have changed a little bit. So what might some reforms look like? Well, let's talk about external things because I think they, they have to come first, but I mean, they have to be on the table. Living wage. I think, I hope the administration will come back to this. I hope they don't let $15 be the enemy of 12. <laughs> I think there could be a way to do a schedule. I think you could start with Arkansas's living wage, which is higher than the national living wage. And it's where Senator Cotton is. But the idea of putting a floor beneath bargaining is really important. And it has a lot of good distributional effects. And I think it creates a more virtuous cycle. I think restoring the promise of the National Labor Relations Act through some version of the PRO Act, I'm not saying that I'm wed to the particular words, but I think the reality is companies are able to grind down um, workers who want to organize. It takes too long and it's too hard and it's not the way the system was designed. And if we could recognize that workers have the right to unionize in the 1930s, you would think that nearly a hundred years later, we could respect this. Contracted workers, I think this is one of the things Many companies, some companies brag, Jim, about having a living wage for their 2,500 direct workers. Right. But they have 5,000 workers who basically work through them through contractors. Do they have a living wage policy so that their contractors actually have to adhere to the same standards? And if they don't, how does that work? And I think we need to look at that. It's a really important thing um, because I know I'll, put, I'll relate to the pandemic. You know, my wife is an occupational therapist and she, uh, spent 31 years at a children's hospital. She was actually going to retire when the pandemic hit. And she stayed because people were, you know, frankly, there were some people who were too afraid to work. Others had things. There are people who come to a lot of hospitals and put themselves at risk throughout the whole pandemic. And they're called the people who clean the hospital. And in many hospitals, they're not direct employees. And do they get a living wage? And what we learned through the pandemic is that a lot of the people most essential to keeping us operating, frankly, get paid less. And they're more likely to be people who've suffered from discrimination in our nation historically to whip black people. And so I think a lot of them also tend to be in the contracted worker class rather than the direct worker class. And so I think we've got to widen our prism on that externally. And then I think trade. I think this is a moment where the best of our values, here we are again, confronting uh, a dictatorial aggression and if we find ourselves with China arming Russia during this, I mean, I don't know where we're going with this, Jim, but that is just horrific, right? Well, one of the ways we defeated communism and fascism is because we recognize that a market economy without appropriate boundaries on externalities is unfair. <laughs> and we work together with the OECD nations to build on things like there should be minimum wages, there should be safe working conditions. There is a sort of limit to the work week that we need to respect. There should not be child labor. When people are older or disabled, they should be treated with dignity. Well, there's been arbitrage against those shared values throughout the West. And I think we need in the trade regime to rebuild that. We need now to quote Sir Paul McCartney, we need hands across the water more than ever. It's the only way you do it. And I will remind people historically that the New Deal was in many ways 
for the United States with the Euro European Union experiment is for Europe. The New Deal really expanded America's regulatory state over the scope of the real economy. And it brought in states like Mississippi, Alabama, and brought them up. That's what's mm -hmm. so atro atrocious about the Supreme Court striking down the Medicaid expansion, because the states that needed it the most, and they're subsidized from states like Delaware and New York <laughs> and Massachusetts and California, mm -hmm. didn't get that. But we brought everybody in. Well, the European Union is the same thing, which is I wish the European Union, to be honest, had been expanded eastward, not so much NATO, <laughs> you know, but we need to build on that because and it needs to be a factor. And we need to focus on the things I talked about, living wage, right to organize safety. We need to make sure in a regionally appropriate way, those things are required. And that all the companies participate. Again, I don't think that the living wage should be the same in a, in, a, in a place that I love, Rio de Janeiro, as it should be in New York City or Delaware. But there should be a, 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 a living wage and there should be upward pressure. But I don't think this is gonna be adequate because how do we get there without some internal reforms? And I think one of the things I would say, Jim, is we've got this binary thing in the US right now where if you have a union, you have a lot of worker voice. And if you don't have a union, you have none. And that is because of historical circumstances involving union bashing and other sorts of things and involving bashing, killing, you know, other riots, that kind of stuff. I think we need to start experimenting and taking a chance because even the upward blip in unionization over the last year or so, it only took us slightly above 10% in private sector companies. That means 90% of the companies basically there's no worker voice. So some people have said, put workers on boards. If you read my article, I'm, I'm, not, I'm for that. If, we, if I could wake up in Sweden tomorrow, there's a lot of reason, like, uh, you know, I'd be happy with the system there or the Germany. It's not a top-down system, just a top-down system. It's one that is built on a whole infrastructure that I talk about, which is there's a stronger unionization requirement and all the companies have works councils at the ground floor level. And so the combination of stronger unions and works councils produces information for the workers who serve on the boards and a source of candidates. Also, as big as Germany is, it is much smaller geographically than the United States. And there's also the issue that only German workers serve on the boards. And we all know that some really good companies who have co-determination locate their US operations in places in the US where there are not many worker rights. Right. So there's some things, Jim, I think, I don't think we're going to go right away to workers on boards. Uh -huh. But these works councils, people forget in Europe, even if you don't have a union, you have a works council. And they deal with things like safety, hours, family friendly leave policies, family friendly scheduling policies. And so even at a company without a union, you had the influence of that. And you also have sectoral bargaining. And so there's a lot more opportunity to get involved with this, and this provides candidates. So my point is, can we create a start? And one way to address a few problems would be to turn compensation committees, which have basically obsessed over C-suite compensation and have really been a tool by the institutions. Institutions are the ones who always complain about executive pay. They're the ones who brought us the executive pay problem. You pay people in options to be your instrument, to do nasty things for you. And if you treat them that way, and that's the way they're, they're going to demand more <laughs> options because you won't give them stable cash. You're asking them to do icky things instead of things they would probably rather do. And it's not coincidental that top pay to executives tracks with returns to stockholders and reductions to workers because that's the alignment, total stock return, right? Well, one of the things I would propose is we stop having compensation committees just focus on the C-suite, that we make them in a workforce committee, that we require them to situate executive pay within an overall workforce plan. I think we should bring to life an idea of mine that actually got in Dodd-Frank and has never been implemented by the SEC, which is the re CEO pay ratio. There is a way to do it well, and, it, and the UK has done it. What happened in the US, uh, Jim, is that the SEC has never put any guidance to allow it to be comparable. And what I propose, gang, would be quartile disclosure. So you'd look at the top quarter, the middle, next quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter of the workforce. What kind of jobs are they? What's your DEI compensation? What are you paying? Mm 
and you situate executive pay then informationally in that. And that's going to put pressure on the board, I think, because I think a lot of boards actually don't know what they pay people. And I would include in that disclosure the contracted workers. So you've got a warts and all, and I would try to have a gym comparable to companies. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you look at at, at five companies in, in, in the same industry, mm -hmm. you can really look and see where they're doing. The competence desk committees would be accountable for this. And I'd also have them do things like DEI, Me Too, all the human relations stuff, which is important and often has no situated um, responsibility at the board level. And I think Leo, if you, if you do that together with disclosure, Jim, you're starting to create a real mm -hmm. accountability vi a, a vibe around this. And I would couple that with the idea that institutional investors, as we move towards disclosure around workforce, around environment, around other issues, it is not adequate to just have that disclosure of public companies. Uh -huh. We should, as it's done in the OECD, if you have a comparable impact of a public company, and I would suggest a billion dollars mm -hmm. in revenue, then I think you should have to file, Jim, something I would call a form EESG. You wouldn't have to file a 10K, but you would have to file basically on those metrics because those things are not important to just investors. And by the way, a lot of investors are, a lot of ordinary people are subject to private company risk because their pension fund might be in, investing in an investment fund that's, in, in, that's doing private equity. Or you're in a community where big charitable institutions, universities, hospitals do. But there's another divide, Jim, which is too, for too long, we've beaten up on the companies and let the investors have a pass. And I'm, I applaud the big three for paying more attention to this, but I'd like to see comparable EESG requirements for them, Jim, on how they take these metrics into account in their stewardship so that they're not talking gang just about that the company should do, but we can actually measure whether they're voting, Jim, and they're investing tracks things. And I'll give you an example, gang of empirical research I did. And uh, Dorothy Lund helped me do it. She's now a great professor at USC, but she was my law clerk then. We looked at how socially responsible funds were voting on social proposals. And so these were funds that picked their stocks based on you know, social metrics, Jim, and, and well, broad thing. They, class, they were, <laughs> they were investing, they were voting on social proposals exactly like every other fund in their complex. Right. Right. And it, because it just passed down. So you had, they were investing in that way, but when it came to like a fair worker protection right. proposal, discrimination mm -hmm. proposal, environmental, Jim, they were just voting with the dividend momentum. Fund. And then and I'll finish have... my last thing. I oh, think okay. <laughs> I, I want to finish this, this. I think two other things we should have to be deal with. I do think that a lot of institutional investors, including labor funds, have contributed to the managed to the market. I don't want to shut down activism, but I think it's time that American activists had to disclose their full economic position um, earlier, that people, other people in the market should know how long they are. They shouldn't be able to tip in this way, and they should have to disclose the contracts that underline their funds so we can understand how long they'll actually hold their stock. And finally, I do think we should voluntarily encourage benefit corporations as long as they're, they're walking the walk, which means I'm Jim, I think they should be more than just a B Corp. I think there should be a certification uh, process. But I think with the procurement at the government level, both at federal and state level, if you have incentives for those in the procurement process, I think that could be very helpful. And I'm very heartened by the number of, of, of public benefit corporations we've seen emerge in the actual um, listing stock market in the past year. So as you can see, Gang, I'm not talking, and I haven't even gotten a tax policy or anything, I won't. But I think we need to turn a bunch of dials, Jim, in the same direction towards sustainable wealth creation through the fair treatment of stakeholders. So there's my, my pitch, right. gang. You got a lot there. So let me, uh, I'm going to start off with something that, because I know one of the people on here has to leave soon. So I'm going to start off with this topic, which is so one thing that I have done is I filed proposals. Okay, so I know you've written a lot about Elizabeth Warren and co-determination, just talked about it. And, you know, that's not work, gonna work here in that, we can't just bring that yeah. model over. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I did put forth because other people had done it was, well, let's use the Rooney rule to put, you know, an employee in the pool 
And of course, that went nowhere. And uh, and then even public pension funds voted against it, uh, uh, which kind of I talked to, you know, members of the public pension funds that were elected by their by the members of the fund and they they were all for it. But the people that actually ran the fund, they were against it. So and I can see being against it because there is no structure to support somebody getting in that position. So one of the things that I've done this year was tried, OK, well, how about we push to get more employee ownership? And with that employee ownership, the the employees get shares and they can use those shares to potentially uh, collaborate with outside investors and perhaps get some representation on the board that way, not necessarily an employee themselves, but by working with others. So um, I just want, and also it seemed- I think so the I, one problem with that, Jim, I think people need to um, realize, I'm all for um, increasing the savings of Americans workers, uh -huh. but too many people Ignore that you can't save until you have adequate amount of money to pay sure, your bills. Right. And so what we really need is to go forward in a way where we raise wages substantially plus do something. And, you know, and, and, and so I look at it more as a wealth gap thing. And I, I think it's also you've got to be careful with people who don't have a lot of money, having them have concentrated positions in their own company. I mean, I think we tend to think about some of this stuff through the, the, the lens of Silicon Valley. Right. And I, I and I think like one of my ideas would be if if we could figure out a way to to require companies essentially if they want any tax advantages to give a thousand dollars match free to every employee in the four hundred one k before there's a match and then essentially ninety ten whatever because you have companies where there are employees who can actually fill the m you know I, I never got to. I was a ju well-paid judge and my wife was an occupational therapist. I never filled the 401k bucket until I left public service. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't. And I think, I think we, we should do more to build the wealth of folks. I, I think representationally, one of the things I like about the workforce committee to think about, Jim, as a proposal is one, you can clearly do that under state law because committee structure, everything is, is clearly a, a valid proposal. It builds on what they're doing in the UK, which is the UK has a sort of director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they have that director thing. It's an approach right. where well, when I when I filed my proposal, I put up the UK model, and I was willing to if they were going with a stewardship council or whatever, I would withdraw the proposal. But no, and that's what I'm saying, to Jim. Is part of my thought was that, and I, one of the things I do with this committee is I I actually allow them. You know, I would allow them to experiment with worker voice. Uh -huh. And so they could actually have like workers form works councils as long as it's not union circumventing and they would be controlled by the committee. But the committee would essentially be like the UK. This committee would have that responsibility. And and I, I, I was hoping, again, we, I'm, I'm for gang. Let's mean, I would love to have the U.S. be a co-determination nation, uh -huh. bottom up and top down. We need to move towards that. And that's where, Jim, I was thinking that this is a way that fits our system that could be a yeah, bridge no, to I, the future. I yeah. totally agree with you, but it, but it also, you know, unless you, uh, I've tried a shareholder proposal, <laughs> you know, that doesn't work. Getting the government to make the change, but let me just- Well, no, I'm on working Jack. on that. I'm let working me, on that. I'm let me call on, on Jack. I'm, by the way, I'm working on that front. Good, well, let and me call think, on Jack. Yeah, hey, no, that's good some people. Hey, Jack. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Thanks so much for the the all the all the great work that you've done. I'm I'm uh, Jack Moriarty. I lead a policy group called Ownership America. We did a discussion with Jim last week, and we're focused on employee ownership, which is part of why Jim brought that up. And and I think your point is well taken on making sure that we're not asking employees to pay for stock, particularly if they're not already with a living wage. But the the good news is that at least in privately held companies, most uh, employee owned companies through an ESOP and employee stock ownership plan, they almost never ask the employees to pay for the stock. So you have a situation where the founder is getting ready to retire, they sell the business and the, the debt that's used to buy the business is paid out through the company profits. And as that happens, you get this retirement, this ESOP account that 
the studies show is, is usually on top of a diversified 401k. So it's this tremendous wealth creation upside potential for the employees. Uh, W.L. Gore and Associates are in Delaware is, is one of the, I think the top 10 employee owned companies, the Gore-Tex makers. And so I'm curious, my, uh, my question is how employee ownership um, when structured the right way might fit in your framework, because I, I understand shareholders and workers have had these such bifurcated outcomes. And I think one of the opportunities is to converge the two, right? If we make the workers the shareholders, not only is there a wealth potential, but also the behavior of the business and the governance has, uh, I think, opportunity to to be more in the direction that we're going for. No, I mean, I, I agree with that, Jack. I'm not, uh, given your name, um, happy <laughs> St. Patrick's Day uh, week. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Thank you very much. It is. Uh, I'm starting to drink already. No, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 actually, I honor it every day, so I never have paused. Uh, but the what I was to say is, I think you know, is, I still think for a lot of employees, Jack, the way the things are going is it's probably going to be a 401k world. And how can you do that? For example, are there ways within 401k to allow company stock to be um to be used? in a way that's prudent, where essentially 50% of the match might be um, company stock and the rest diversified. I think, you know, that that seems to me to be, you know, a potentially practical approach to it. I, I think the, the and, and I think the, uh, the, the other thing that comes with this is also what I said about institutional investors, Jim, which is you know, to what extent do they have to factor these kinds of work, worker issues into their their investing when they're um, essentially run essentially running retirement money? So I, I like the idea of ownership. Well, I'm just saying it's complicated in a nation. Well, if we if we had actually had the same level jack of gain sharing with workers that we had in say 1975 or 1965, it would be a lot more practical at this stage to be thinking about this. But one of the problems is that for so many people what's right ahead of them in the next six months is so difficult. So I think as long as we keep an eye on both sides of it, and and that's why I was thinking about this match idea, which is, you know, could we get everybody that first thousand dollars without a match, right? Because, you know, you also get hooked, people hooked on it, but it gets desperate. I mean, people are like, how can I put money into this? Well, because one thing, since, since 2003, shareholders have had to vote on if a company is going to do uh, a shareholder distribution to its employees. We've had to vote on that, but we've never learned. The only thing that we see is that, okay, here's how much the CEO got. Here's how much the named executives got. Here's how much the board got. We don't see how anybody, what shares anybody else got. No, no, and it's a big issue. You know, I am working with members of Congress on something and I, I and they want to do some stuff on buybacks. And I keep telling them, you know, be honest, I view that mostly as a symptom, Jack, not, mm. not a thing. But one of the things I said is if you're going to limit buybacks, be careful that you're excluding buybacks that are necessary to rebound for genuine grants to employees. Uh -huh. That if you, you know, put, separate, the, level of yeah, separate the C-suite and the directors, right? Because, right, Jack, if you give a certain amount of, of equity to, you know, say there's 3000 employees, can, you know, there's like 25 people, the board and the C-suite, put them aside. If you're doing it right, the bulk of the equity is actually to the 3000. That's eventually going to have an effect on your stockholder base. And you want, may want to have a buyback to replenish, right? You need to have shares to give your workers. So to be careful, you know, of people talking at one side of their mouth, they want employee ownership, and then they just want to stifle all buybacks. I don't know that those things, you have to take a more sophisticated, that's why I, I like, I like getting at causes and incentives rather than whack-a-mole, because I'm confident that Wall Street and CFOs can figure out how to get money to people if they want, right? I mean, you can always increase the dividend, but I think Jack, I think, you know, what are your ideas? I'd be interested in hearing, because um, I think we do need policy in this area. And I think it's people in their 401k are already feel kind of disempowered because you really do basically have a choice of mutual funds. And if you go to a different family, you don't, you get the same choices and you're not the ones who are actually voting 
the shares, which is on the corporate political part. One of the things I've been urging the big three to do is shut down the corporate political spending. You know, they don't have our money for this reason, and they could do that, Jack. I mean, if, <coughs> if, the, if the Jack Bogle rule of having to get 75% approval from your stockholders was the rule, we could eliminate a lot of this rent seeking. But I'd be interested, Jack, if you have some ideas that on, on this. Um, You're right. I appreciate the question and, and, and your views on this. I, I'd say they're uh, different depending on we're talking about private or public companies. On the private company side, where it's easier to do a full transition to employee ownership, a full sale um, when you have a succession event. One of the problems is that typically that requires the seller to take back a significant subordinated note. And so you've got a seller that might have you know, big offers with big multiples from private equity or a competitor stacked up against a, a less competitive ESOP deal. And that that's not a great place to, to be. So we're working with congressional partners on um, standing up a whole cohort of structured equity funds that can actually cash out the seller and provide a much more attractive deal that can compete constructively and actually bring private equity into this model where you're selling to the employees. And then when the financial buyer exits five years down the road, you're not terminating the employee ownership. So that's, um, that's really where our focus is federally on the private company side, but on the public company side, it's, it's really what Jim mentioned. We're, we're really trying to make the case in the context of the SEC human capital disclosures that, that we have evidence that, employee ownership when it's broadly shared can be financially material and yet we don't have disclosures on this and so what's the the pay ceo pay ratio equivalent for the wealth of the company for the for the stock uh, right and i and i think if we had that it'd look a lot worse than um than the pay ratio oh uh, no i think it would it would think it would look horrible and i agree with you and that's where i think jack uh, you know if you look at my paper on the on the comp committee there's a uh, there's actually with with Kirby Smith there's actually a, a part about the quartile idea. If you think about that quartile disclosure idea I put in, it would be pretty easy to add not just information on salary and benefits, but on equity grants. Right. And I think what you're going to find is there isn't much of them. You know right. that, that that especially for for uh, hourly employees that that's what they get is their hourly wage. And that for lower level salaried employees, there might be something, but it's going to be swamped by the C-suite. And one of the things I've always said as a business school that matters, like $5 million extra to the C-suite across five people, as opposed to $5 million invested in the workforce. You know, frankly, I don't know, most families would take an extra thousand to help them with a vacation sure. or to buy an iPad for a kid who needs one for high school, you know, and the fact that their employer helped them with that, even if it's a bonus, would be motivational. And, and so I think what you're talking about is really right, seeing the entire picture, Jack, which is, you know, if the executive stuff and the director comp is going to be so much in equity and show us what the, what the, the deal is. I, I suppose if the CEO comp is done right, it already includes that. But what you're also saying is, how does that flow through the whole organizational structure? Um, well, we see where companies do have substantial worker ownership, the wealth gap. That would, if if say if we're, if companies say if the S and P 500, if five percent of it was owned by the uh, by the employees, not the C suite and the directors and all that, that would actually have it. That would make a dent in the wealth gap. You know, that's and true. look and at the IMF, the IMF sh study shows that if you give 1% to the top 20%, you reduce uh, gross domestic product. Oh, absolutely. If you, if you give it to the bottom percent, you, you raise GDP. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'm saying, Jack and Jim, I, I, I agree with you. I think you just have to realize this. We are not in Japan in the 1970s. We're not in uh, a person who got it to be an employee in General Motors in the 1950s. And so the idea that the worker is likely to be have a career at that particular company is far less. That's true. You know, it's financial. And so all I'm saying is I think there should be a balance here. And a lot of what you're also saying, Jim, is I think if you aggregate what American workers, I, I mean, we got to be very clear about this. Stockholders, stockholders 
as a class have democratized, which is the more people who are exposed to the stock market has grown numerically. A dollar in dividends compared to a dollar in wages is has a much different social impact because even though more people are 401k investors, if you look at the typical 401k account, it's shockingly low for people who are even solidly upper middle class. People forget that median family income is about $60,000. Someone who is a school teacher, somebody who's making $95,000, you know, it's hard for them, honestly, to, to have big 401k accounts. So I think if we're going to go to a company specific thing, Jim and Jack, we just have to be careful. It's got to be balanced. Sure. And sure, I would sure. think that the company specific part could should be no more than probably 25%. Yeah. And, but then what we should also be doing, I love Jack's idea because what we're also showing is you're showing to the vanguards and the fidelities and the black rocks of the world that you have real workers money. And I think they're getting that now and that these workers require policies, corporate governance policies that encourage fair treatment of workers and fair gain sharing, because that's really what they need to build their wealth. And by the way, when they get that more in wages, and especially if we can do some things, Jack, to encourage um, employers to give, but if they can get higher wages, they actually can put more in their 401k. And what mm -hmm. you're saying, Jim, is honestly, a person who's going to spend money and is going to invest, is just going to be do more than somebody who's going to build their next boat. Right, right. Let's ask, how about Michael? Michael's got a, his hand up. Hi, my hand's up. Let's try rapid fire questions here. Sure. And oh, I, I'm I not nervous. Uh, I, hope, I get I hope. nervous when people ask me questions. Well, no, we're just, you know, I know. We're, approaching the, we're approaching the hour. I, so. I hope I hope we can handle my question. I wasn't going to ask a question, but I was just going to listen because I like, no. but something that uh, Judge Strine said made me think of something. It, it sounds like, looking at this kind of broadly, that part of this debate is one of means versus ends. And let me let me explain what I mean by that. And let's use corporate political spending as the case study or the example. That, because something you said earlier when you were talking about your remarks at about minute 20 of this, made me think of this, is that whether or not we we want, and I would like better disclosure of corporate political spending, it sounds like part of this debate or a big part of the debate is around what's the best way to make that happen. Is it through a robust FEC process where disclosure similar to what is imposed on political candidates, that's the only thing that comes to mind, uh, is... Um, sensible or whether an investor-driven disclosure regime is more sensible and, and, and makes more sense. And, and what I, and I think I'm just looking for a little bit of, of feedback on this. My sense is, is that maybe you personally would prefer a federal similar FEC approach and not necessarily have an investor-driven approach to political spending. But maybe it's the case that because that process is so dysfunctional right now, I don't think there's not even full representation on the FEC, that we have to rely on investor driven disclosure regime regimes. And that's just political spending this we can apply this thinking to I, no, know, I agree. Is Michael, this, what, is this, what, is this that, sort of the right way to think about it? Yes, because here's what Citizens United did. Right. Right, which is the first, you know, a little less in the corporate law, but we went from if you ever, anybody ever wonders whether the why the Delaware General Corporation Law is called general, it's not because rather than colonel or major, <laughs> it's because we went in this country from, from everything being Michael Wright, a specifically chartered corporation like Dutch and East Indies or right, things right, right. like that, or Dartmouth, to having you could go form a corporation under a general incorporation law and you lived with it. As soon as we started having general incorporation statutes take hold. Well, the very biggest, that's when political campaign finance reform started coming right. in place. And, and Teddy Roosevelt and, and Eli Root and all, it was not like a liberal revolution. It was the idea that these things are not human and they're different. Right. Citizens United basically took away Congress's ability to regulate corporate political spending. Absolutely. And so the problem is the only way you can kind of potentially get at it is 
you can require as a matter of corporate law and corporate governance that the investors vote on it. With the big three, we've seen with class, we've seen with their love for managed to the market, honestly, Jim, <laughs> that when the big three decide that they want something, it can happen really quickly. So in terms of public companies, I'd actually go beyond disclosure to the Bogle approach, which is any corporate oh. political spending has to be under a plan approved by the stockholders. Sure. I think, and if you get momentum around that, I think the problem, and this is something I've heard, is how do we deal with the large private companies? Because the large private companies, Michael, tend to have a large stockholder. Oh, absolutely. Now, one of the things is if you did a 75% threshold, it might actually hit some of the uh, things. And I, by the way, I think private equity firms really don't like this game. And so I'm not sure that it's the private equity firms that tend to give a lot in the corporate political process at a company level. Uh, they may do it at the parent level. Right. Um, but I think it would at least be a good start. I, I, I have friends, like I, I think that the people, uh, Bruce Fried and his group at the Center for Corporate the Political Responsibility do great work. I just don't think disclosure is enough. No. And no. I, I think He's that- He's trying to move beyond that right now. And right, I think, right. but I think, Michael, you're right. The Supreme Court has basically taken this off the table for the appropriate authority. Like, and, and the only way we deal with this is really with- in the corporations themselves. But what I heard you say is like, suppose suppose we could, you know, wave a wand and in the next Congress, we got, um, you know, the Lewis Act and 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 that's actually doesn't concern political spending, but we got a really robust, thorough, proper um, regulation right. and disclosure in this case of, of corporate, not just personal corporate political spending, you'd be satisfied, dare I say, even happy to to let that regulatory apparatus do its work if and, it would work yeah i mean yeah, okay, okay, great. It's, it's it's not, you don't you don't have a preference for investors doing it this no is, no i actually okay. the opposite i mean i do think yeah. i i actually believe honestly that we're much better off in this society with legitimately imposed protections for consumers workers right. and the and certainly our political process belongs to human beings and that's why, Michael, I came around reluctantly to the view that we had to do stuff internally to corporate governance. Okay. But I think because of the interactive effect of corporate wealth on the externality protections, I think we, we can't avoid that. Yes. And I also think we could do a little tempering of managing to the market. What I mean is I, I view like moving towards the benefit corporation model, like well, it's kind of a restoration of where we used to be that kind of just accounts for the fact that the investor class has changed because ultimately... There's no way companies are going to not be responsive to the profit motive. They can't survive if they don't. By the way, workers care more about their company being profitable than any other constituency because that who's going to have a future with a profitless company? People take pride in it. Right. And the other thing is that even under the benefit corporation model, frankly, it's the stockholders who elect directors. And so they still have the whip hand. But I think giving them a little bit more room to balance interest, Michael, in the world that we have is you know some useful space so i think we're at a very time where we have to be kind of pragmatic and to quote again sir paul i think we gotta actually try to get back to where we once belonged jojo i mean some of this is actually not new it's actually trying to fit in a globalized world we're trying to get a restoration of some of the values that served us well and then frankly i would say michael to extend them to places like India and Brazil, where sure. the current governments may not share our values, but the people do, and where in a regionally appropriate way, there's really the ability to knit the world together, where we capture market dynamism, which does provide a lot of opportunity for people, but in a way that is, is more sustainable. We can't learn the lessons of the 19th century um, relearn them at a slower rate as we did before, or we will destroy the planet and ourselves. That's Let right. me ask you a question about fiduciary duty. Since, since you're a- I love fiduciary former, duty. I mean, yes, I, I know life. you do. So, <laughs> so uh, the big four, you've written a lot about the big four and those folks. So should the big four have a fidu and they're universal owners, should they have a fiduciary duty to their portfolio and yes. as beneficiaries to not to 
so that their portfolio companies do not externalize costs. Should yes. that because right I now they're they, just looking at that individual company and they're saying our fiduciary duty is to make so many, it so that, yeah, Jim, so many scholars yeah. messed this up and said because an index fund tries to achieve a match of an index that that's its only fiduciary duty. If that's the case, then they shouldn't even vote. Yeah. Right. I mean, because they can their mathematics model or can do it. If you're invested in the index 500 and you know that your investors are not going to be protected by you selling until a stock leaves that, then your stewardship and fiduciary duty uh, should be devoted towards making sure that the corporate governance policies that are adopted by that, those companies are the most likely to produce sustainable growth net of externalities. Why? Because you own the index 500. It's a proxy for the whole economy. You're, you don't sell out of bad companies. You, you basically need growth net of externality. And by the way, because you have, you have the smart money, the index investors, there are people saving for retirement. And for all the reasons we talked about, they're likely to have um, also be investors in your debt, mutual funds. They're likely to be workers. And so the answer is absolutely yes. And what I, what I proposed in my Roosevelt paper, and I'm working with some people in Congress, is that certain types of investment funds have a mandatory duty to consider these factors. That would be um, index funds right. and retirement funds because of the unique nature of their commitment. But that all investment fiduciaries be able to take into account as a matter of their prudent exercise of their fiduciary duties, um, sustainability factors. I want to add this video clip to our rebuttal to BlackRock so, because we've got that proposal to BlackRock and they're saying, oh no, our fiduciary duty is to the individual company, each individual company in our portfolio, not to our portfolio. Yeah, and, I, and that doesn't make any sense to me because no. you're, you're, and it's like, by the way, it's the same sort of thinking. I wrote a paper a long time ago and I looked at, there were, there were mutual funds Jim, during, remember the H, uh, many people remember the Hewlett Packard Compact merger, which is very controversial. And there were many mutual funds that voted yes and no on the same merger. Right. They voted yes as a compact stockholder because they liked the premium they were getting from HP. Right. And they voted no as an HP stockholder because <laughs> it was a weird, weird thing. With, and they voted no because they thought HP was overpaying. Mm -hmm. And somebody, I said they were, I, I made a mistake. I said, these are our, our are similar cap companies. And somebody said, oh, you're wrong, Vice Chancellor, because I was Vice Chancellor then. And he said, you're wrong. HP is twice as big as Compaq. And I said, well, then the decision was twice as stupid. Because <laughs> if you actually have both companies in your portfolio and you think it's harming the larger one, and that's a bigger share of your portfolio because the way indexes work, right, Jim? It's, uh -huh. is, then why wouldn't you vote your compact shares no. And the answer is, gang, they have so many votes that it just went down compact and they assume that all, their, all they own is compact and they didn't take into account that for many of their investors, they own both companies. Right. And one of the things we need to do though, that's why I've also proposed that we have say on pay votes every four years, unless you change your comp plan and that 25% of the companies come up every year so that folks actually vote in a thoughtful way. We have flooded these institutions with votes and it doesn't make for more informed voting. And ultimately it's the other stakeholders who pay the price because the more you amp up, Jim, I'm sorry, the power of the stock market, the less likely the companies are to be able to make those decisions. And frankly, the less likely that institutions, and I say BlackRock, I think is trying to get it better. I think State Street's probably the one that seems to align its statements and values the best, but they have a challenge when there's so many votes. And I think if you can get a, you know, a more patient approach to voting, then, and then also, as I said, I think they need to disclose how they vote on EESG. And it should be the same kind of rubric that we're looking at the companies should be aligned with something so we know whether the institutions are doing their part of the job. Well, we're hoping that's gonna be key because, you know, as you know, there's a rulemaking going through the SEC right now that will require that those funds disclose their votes in machine readable format so that you can actually compare the votes without hiring Jackie Cook, who's here, or, you know, without. Not uh, that we shouldn't be hiring you, Jackie. <laughs> we should be. <laughs> but 
No, uh, but I mean, I think there's a lot that we have to do here. And, and I would just say, as some of you are advocates for this, I think we got to be really careful that we also do things smartly. I'm a little bit worried that we're going to be um, having a really overly ambitious and not very focused approach to climate change disclosure. Uh -huh. And I think there's probably 35% of the industries that are probably 90% of the issue that if we were to phase it in and focus on them. And, 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 and what I mean by that is for a lot of companies, their impact on the environment is basically the, just the, that you took a thousand people of households and those a thousand households have an impact on the environment. You now bring them to one place for eight hours a day. And that's what the company does. So that's what it does. It's not in the energy producing business. It's not frankly in the distributional chain. It's just the fact is a bunch of people come to work and they turn on the lights and the other thing, not saying they shouldn't do their share, but nobody knows from scope three, it's tremendously costly. And, and I think phasing it in and making clear that the focus is on facilitation and education and helping the companies get it right. Frankly, not having a private right of action so that plaintiff's lawyers can turn, um, honestly, Jim's uh, EESG disclosures into a plaything. Mm -hmm. And leave, not saying no enforcement, but leave it to the SEC, the legitimate agency that represents us all. I think if we do things like that, and we also try to knit these things together, we're going to be much more effective. A lot of companies are trying to do the right thing, but there's a lot being thrown at them. And the challenge for the, the, it's a lot different to deal with the climate impact of ExxonMobil or BP or a trucking company or the airlines, right? Than it is a company like Salesforce or retail, right? I mean, right. I just think, and, and I think if we try to do everything at once, <clears throat> try to hit these companies, you risk not doing it well. And, um, and not having as much impact. And frankly, because we haven't dealt with the double materiality problem in legislation, and I'm trying again, that's another thing I wish to fix. The SEC's legal authority to do some of what it's doing is not as firm as you would like it to be. And to be honest, I don't actually think a lot of these disclosures should be solely focused on uh, investors. There's other reasons, candidly, why there's a focus on climate now and on workers. And it's not just because people own stock. And I'm a liberal. I was never scared by Ronald Reagan out of being a liberal. I didn't have to adopt a, a name associated with Teddy Roosevelt. I'm perfectly happy to be associated with Franklin and um, Martin Luther King. Is I'm a liberal, but let's be candid. I also believe in Orwell. He was, he was candid. Let's be real. We're talking about issues because we know that they're material to our society and to people who are stakeholders of companies who don't necessarily own shares. And we haven't grappled with that. And we haven't grappled with the problem that the good people at the SEC are being putting on a lot of pressure by, in, in a good faith way. But shouldn't it be the EPA, um, the Department of Interior and Energy, helping with what the climate disclosure should be? Shouldn't it be the Department of Labor and then the SEC be coordinating it? And and, and again, I hope we're going, to affect, we're going to put this on the private companies, not just the public companies, because if, you, if we think that we're going to cure climate by just having all the energy producing companies become private companies, mm -hmm. and they won't have to go to annual meetings, right, Jim, in the spring, and they won't have to do these proposals, that is not going to solve society's problem. Mm -hmm. It might solve the managers of the companies not being whip, whipsawed by by frankly, some investors who talk a little bit out of both sides of their mouth. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I was a regulator for, you know, 30 years. I worked for the state of California. I worked mostly in environmental protection. And one of the reasons I got into shareholder activism was I was being regulated by the, com by the companies that were, I was supposed to be regulating, you know, I, I go over to the Capitol, they'd write the bills. Yes. And uh, so, you know, well, and that's what I said, there was a proposal and I don't want to interpret, but basically said that one of the companies should essentially separate into a clean energy company. Right. Sure. And then a dirty energy company. Right. And when, by the way, I use dirty energy. I confess I have a hybrid, but I still use dirty energy and I still like air conditioning. I'm guilty. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm as guilty as anybody who works in these companies. And if we don't stop shaming people who work in these industries That's and we don't bring true. them along, it's not going to say, but think about that separation. Right. How is the clean energy yeah, company going to get a, capital? Isn't it the transition? And why don't we bring these people along? And right. frankly, if we're so on our high horse, why don't we go to Congress and pass laws that right. price carbon and, and that apply equally to all of us, including us as individuals? And so I, I think we got to be really skeptical. We can't and, pass any laws. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, that's where the public-private thing, though, comes in. And one of the things I said to my friends at the Little Engine that could is I think you have a responsibility to be at that Exxon Noble meeting in five or six years. Uh -huh. And if the management has done what you want and the return is down, not because they've done anything wrong, but because they're executing on the plan to become thing, are you going to be there with them? Uh -huh. yeah. Because if you're just going to be there at some moment, this is a journey. We didn't well, get here immediately. And the idea that, that you could just you know, put pressure on people in a meeting and then all of a sudden, magically, you're going to have mm -hmm. them do all great and good things. And we see this with the Ukraine crisis right now, right? Think about the shift already in how we're thinking about energy. And I don't, I actually, I'm disappointed because I urged as a national security, I urged that the Democratic Party, I urged this 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, that we emphasize energy independence in a clean energy way as a national security issue and as a growth issue. And to point out that where we were sending troops historically <laughs> is in places we don't necessarily want to go on vacation, right. but produce oil. And if we would not entangle ourselves there and move to the future, we could both tackle climate or whatever. I think that's still true. There's a risk right now that we're going to go back to, we better just pump out the right. oil and it just shows that the difficulty, this is not going to be a momentary thing, and it's going to involve a long-term commitment. And all I'm saying about the way we do the climate disclosure is the extent to which the SEC and the government understands that this is a difficult journey for companies, that they have to make money and do a lot of other things, that scope three, nobody really knows how to do for a lot of these companies. And that we should be on a journey together that's educa educational, facilitative, and that we should not be mentioning the enforcement word around this for a few years. And that we, could, if we start with the industry segments that will have the most impact and we do it well, we'll have more credibility, less likelihood of legal challenge, and we'll set an example that we can use in other areas. I don't think it's true that on the workforce side, and I don't use the human C word, is I think that can go forward in a sensible way earlier. But even there, I would say, Jim, let's start with some sensible metrics and build on them and have them be comparable and then move from B minus metrics up to A. Is, e, is e, 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 o, one disclosure, is that a reasonable metric? I don't know. I mean, I, I think... I mean, one thing I, I'm, I'm asking for EEO one disclosure with disclosure of shares that they give. Yeah, I mean, see, I would rather if we're going to go this way, right. not be so reductive as just dumping EEOC one. Yeah. I think yeah. I think I'd rather build around the whole entire workforce, what uh, they get paid. Yeah. And I think it's a crude metric. And there are some reasons why you want people to feel, you know, you want candid reporting and if you start just making that public i i'm not against it i just think uh -huh. it's it's too narrow i also think it racializes and 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 makes a gender issue yeah something yeah, that's cool. really much more common to people like uh -huh. and so i think if if, if I, I was saying dei metrics for each quartile uh -huh. i wasn't necessarily saying you had to just dump the eo one report uh -huh. and yeah. and there may be ways that like for example I, I find it very interesting if you read the sustainable, and we got to stop soon, I know, or we're over time, but the sustainability <laughs> uh, reports of a minutes, lot of companies. Right, keep going, keep going. If you, well, <laughs> if, if you read a lot of the sustainability reports of a lot of companies, they will talk about um, improvements at the board level. Uh -huh. They will talk more about women. And they will, they will sometimes talk about Black people at the board level. They very rarely talk about Black people in the managerial ranks. 
Right. And one of the reasons why I would like to get towards integrative reporting, integrative reporting is I think we need comparability and I don't think we need advertisements about people building playgrounds. And I think you can't just talk about what, you know, look gang, two thirds of my, my hair is looking great. Right. <laughs> but if I, you know, where's the part about my bangs. And so, but actually I, I do, Jim, I'm kind of starting to run out of gas. No, I, no. Well, it, my it, wife it, has a hula group that's going to start downstairs pretty soon. So the uh, hula music will start floating up here. Wow. Well, that sounds much oh. more. Can well, I think your audience <laughs> should be able to transfer to that. But, <laughs> by the way, it's been an honor to be with you all. And thanks for the great questions. And thanks for inviting me, Jim. So fantastic to have you on, Leo. Take Thank care. Thank you so Enjoy much.